It's so good to be back. It's so good to be back in my home confines right here in my studio. We got NFL playoffs to talk about. I got KD talking about he deserves to be in the greatest of all time conversation. And a question for you. I want you to contemplate that. What in the hell does former President Donald Trump have in common with Cat Williams? Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's roll. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you at the very least three times per week over the digital airwaves of YouTube. I'm finally back right here in my beautiful New Jersey studio. By the way, appreciate all the love and support from all of my subscribers and followers. We have now exceeded 524,000 subscribers over the first 10 months. It'll reach 525 by, the, by this afternoon, by the way. So I want to say thank you. Appreciate the love. Keep it coming. And I'm going to keep on coming. Make no mistake about that. To continue to like and follow the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on YouTube. Just click the bell to get notified of all of our new content. And while you're doing all of that, please don't forget to pick up a copy of my New York Times best-selling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. By the way, it's now in paperback. So you just go to straightshooterbook.com to get yourself a copy. I got some NFL items to get into. Again, a little basketball coming down the pike. The one and only Gilbert Arenas, part two of my interview with him. That's already th there. And obviously, I'll be talking about that. And of course, I'll be getting into Shannon Sharp, Cat Williams, and Donald Trump. What the hell am I talking about? What the hell do I have on my mind as it pertains to that? Stick around, tune in. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's get to some NFL action first and foremost because a heavyweight battle, supposedly a heavyweight battle, took place in, um, obviously, yesterday, last night to be specific, in Orchard Park, Buffalo, New York, Western New York. It was cold, it was freezing, a lot of snow on the side, people shoveling snow out the arena and the stadium and all of that stuff. We get all of that. Patrick Mahomes purportedly outdo Josh Allen for a 27-24 win, and the Chiefs are moving on to their sixth straight AFC championship game. All six years as a starter for Patrick Mahomes, all six years in the AFC title game. Now, Contrary to what you believe, I'm quite a nice guy. Don't tell nobody, but it's true. I am a very, very nice guy. Except to kickers. Because when I saw Tyler Bass miss wide right, I started hearkening back to the 80s when the Buffalo Bills were down 2019 and you had an opportunity to win a Super Bowl championship and you couldn't get it done. It was similar to what happened yesterday evening. And the Buffalo Bills, yet again, after four straight years of winning the AFC East Division crown, can't find themselves in a Super Bowl, yet again. This is different than losing four straight Super Bowls as they did in the 90s. It's a little different than that. Now you can't even get there. And to me, it's not so much about blame, but it is about acknowledging the fact that the Buffalo Bills blew a prime opportunity. You got Josh Allen throwing that pass to Stephon Diggs, a bomb that was in the hands of Stephon Diggs, and he drops that pass. You're an all-world receiver, my brother. You got to catch that pass. You got to catch that pass. That is not what happened. He dropped it and went right through his arms, period. Three receptions for 21 yards on the afternoon, that's unacceptable for somebody as great as Stephon Diggs. That's number one. Number two, despite pressure from the Kansas City Chiefs and having an offensive lineman basically backpedaling and being pushed into you, you're Josh Allen, you got to step aside to hit a wide open Khalil Shakur in the end zone. You got to make that throw. You got to make that throw. It is about moments. And that was a moment for Josh Allen to step up and unfortunately, he came up short. That man threw that football and skipped, and it missed Shakur by about five yards. It was like me throwing the first pitch at Yankee Stadium, damn it. I mean, it was that bad. It was almost crickets. You can't make that kind of throw in that situation. You got to find a way to offset that. You're looking at the comparisons right there. Patrick Mahomes, 17 to 23, 215 yards. Josh Allen, 26 to 39, 186 yards. You threw 39 passes, but only 186 yards. 16 of those passes, by the way, were behind the line of scrimmage. So guess what? You really, really wasn't making much noise throwing the football downfield because you threw for less than 100 yards when it came to the other 23 passes that you threw. And so that's not that impressive. I know he was running the football effectively. I'll give him credit for that. And we know that Josh Allen is a stud. So 
when we think about elite quarterbacks in the National Football League, you got to give credit where credit is due and recognize the fact that the brother is big time. But there are levels. And when you saw what Lamar Jackson did against Houston, when you saw what Patrick Mahomes did throughout the afternoon, you see that there are levels. And that is a place that Josh Allen has still failed to reach, to have reached. Plain and, plain and simple. In the AFC Divisional Playoff game, a couple of years ago, you lost to Cincinnati. Before that, you lost to Patrick Mahomes. Okay? So you're talking about losing to Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs. You're talking about losing to Joe Burrow once in the playoffs. And you're talking about being 5-1 against everybody else. That's unacceptable. So if you're looking for a reason why the Buffalo Bills, in their last six games, or the Buffalo Bills, period, can't find themselves in a Super Bowl, there you have it. Kansas City Chiefs don't look like the same team. This was a prime opportunity. And if you're the Baltimore Ravens and you're going up against the Buffalo Bills and Josh Allen, who can run with the football as well as throw the football, who knows what kind of game that may have turned into, even though their defense is suspect due to a plethora of injuries. No matter which way you slice it, it was a prime opportunity. The Buffalo Bills didn't take advantage of it. And their kicker, that's your only damn job. You do nothing else. You don't go get coffee or tea. You don't sit up there. You ain't even an equipment manager, for crying out loud. Your only job is to kick the damn field goal. And you missed. A 44-yarder. To me, the brother shouldn't have even been in the locker room talking to the media. He should have kept his uniform on and walked straight out of the arena. And the only delay that should have existed was the fact that he was scared that he'd probably run into Bills fans whose hearts he'd broken. But outside of that, it is what it is. Buffalo Bills are going home. Kansas City Chiefs advance to the AFC Championship game, awaiting them as Lamar Jackson who is our soon-to-be league MVP for a second time in his career. First time he won was in 2019. Second time is going to be this year. When you see what he did in stomping Detroit, when you see what he did in stomping Seattle, when you see what he did in stomping the San Francisco 49ers the way that he did during the regular season, you see the way he runs the football, you see the way he's throwing the football, you see the way he's leading that offense in Baltimore. Without Mark Andrews, by the way, the reliable tight end who got hurt weeks ago, a running game, spreading the ball around, the Zay Flowers, the OBJs of the world and others, combined with his excellence running the football, not just throwing it, and a defense that is stout with a coach led by John Harbaugh, the head coach, who's doing big things. You can't say enough about Lamar Jackson. C.J. Stroud, don't worry about him. That's a future star in the making. He'll be just fine. He'll be just fine. This is his first playoff game. He was a rookie. And we have to understand that you're going up against a stiff Baltimore defense. What did you expect from him? So I'm not knocking C.J. Stroud at all. His time will come. It just is not now. It, the time is now for the Baltimore Ravens. They're the best team in football. And what we have to do and we have to start contemplating is what are we going to be able to say when all is said and done if Lamar Jackson pulls this off? That's what we have to ask ourselves. During my day job on ESPN on First Take this morning with my man, Shannon Sharp, he was pointing out about Lamar Jackson, talking about how folks said he should have been a running back, how he should not have been a quarterback, how people were doubting him all the time. So what does he do? He comes in the NFL, he takes it by storm, he wins, a, he wins a league MVP. But over the last two years, he missed the last five games of the regular season, wasn't a, an ex, uh, wasn't a participant in the postseason because obviously he was injured. But it still didn't stop him from chasing the bag, demanding the bag, and by the way, not having conventional quintessential representation in order to get it. One minute you heard it was about a friend. Another minute you heard it was his mama. You didn't know who the hell was representing him. He was supposedly representing himself. He was never going to get his money. The barriers that stood in his way, the obstacles that served as impediment to whatever money he was looking to receive was standing right in front of his face. He didn't give a damn. He went out there and he got his money anyway, 260 million to be specific. Over 187, 188 million guaranteed. And so when we look at it from that perspective, for him to now step on the football field and the play lights out the way that he's played, this is his time. But if there was ever a roadblock standing in his path, it is that of Patrick Mahomes. Six years as a starter in the National Football League. Six years in the AFC Championship game. Three Super Bowl appearances, two Super Bowl titles already, and possibly en route to a third. That's what we're looking at. And if Lamar Jackson wanted to be elevated to the top of the food chain, wanted to be elevated to an individual that was that superstar, one that even exceeded Patrick Mahomes, you got to beat the man in order to be the man. And that's exactly what he's in a position to do. They're the number one seed. They have home field advantage. 
universally recognized as being the better team this year because the Kansas City Chiefs was too busy having a bunch of receivers leading the league and drop passes. And as a result of that, Despite what we saw from them yesterday, Patrick Mahomes, Marquez Valdez-Scantling actually catching passes. Of course, Travis Kelsey being that future Hall of Famer. Of course, Taylor Swift was in attendance with Mama and with, with Jason Kelsey. Shirtless and all, they showed up and handled their business. On the road for the first time in the Patrick Mahomes era, it was the first time they played a road game in the postseason with Patrick Mahomes as their quarterback. And they went in there and looked just like they would have looked at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City, Missouri. So Kansas City is not going anywhere. We've got an epic AFC championship game in Baltimore between the Chiefs and the Ravens, between Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. we got to wait and see what happens. There's a lot of storylines out there. The San Francisco 49ers in the NFC, they're your top seed. They don't look like it. Right now, let's be honest. If we had to sit up here and pick between the San Francisco 49ers against the Chiefs or the Baltimore Ravens, they wouldn't be considered the favorites based on what we've been seeing over the last few weeks. They showed up and bust the Philadelphia Eagles' ass in Philadelphia. That is true. They were out there to prove a point. They came dressed in black, saying they were dressed for a funeral, the Eagles' funeral, and then promptly went at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia and stomped the Eagles. And we said, damn, nobody looks better than San Francisco. Ever since then, they've looked suspect. Their defense has been soft. They've given a little bit too much. Debo Samuel has been in and out because he hasn't been the healthiest in the world. Obviously, Kittle can still play. CMC, Christian McCaffrey, that brother's something special. We know what he brings to the table. But he wasn't healthy for a couple of games at the tail end of the season. And Brock Purdy, as a result, didn't look as formidable as he looked. We were talking about him being a league MVP candidate when in reality he didn't deserve to be mentioned in the same breath as Lamar Jackson. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. And so now that we've gotten that out the way and we've seen how they've looked, how vulnerable they've looked, Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers could have easily beat them. They had the lead late in the game. San Francisco comes back. McCaffrey runs in for a touchdown. What do we find ourselves in a situation looking at Jordan Love and wondering whether or not he was going to be able to exploit them compared to what he did against the Cowboys, or reminiscent to what he did for, against the Cowboys. What happens? He throws an interception. We see that for what it is, and we say, Jordan Love may have thrown an interception. Jordan Love may have failed to lead Green Bay down the field and win that game. But you know what else we have to acknowledge? Jordan Love looked a hell of a lot better than Brock Purdy. He was dealing with the same weather conditions. He was dealing with the same slippery ball because it was raining so hard. But Jordan Love looked better. And as we look towards next season, and we think about some of the quarterbacks in the National Football League, Brock Purdy can play. He's not a scrub. But we might have blown him up a little bit too much. We might have done that. When Jordan Love threw that interception to Dre Greenlaw to seal the win, we get it. We understand that's not a mistake that Jordan Love should have made, but Jordan Love played lights out for the better part of this season. Since week nine of the season, he had 21 touchdowns and one interception. When I'm looking at Brock Purdy right now, here's my issue. I think everything has to be ideal. Debo goes out with his shoulder injury in this playoff game against Green Bay. Suddenly, Brock Purdy isn't looking bad just because of weather conditions. He's struggling to get the ball to the right people. He looks inaccurate throughout the evening up until that final drive when he had to get something right. He handled his business and major props to him for that. But with the Detroit Lions coming into town, with them having a running back in Gibbs, with them having a quarterback in Jared Goff, who is better than Brock Purdy, by the way, with them having Amon Ra St. Brown and the Jamison Williams of the world and others, we know what they bring to the Laporte at the tight end spot who was supposed to be injured, but he's there giving you a contribution. Detroit is nothing to sneeze at offensively. Defensively, even though their secondary seems a bit soft at times, they can get to the quarterback led by Hutchinson. And I'm looking at the Detroit Lions, and I can't summarily rule out the possibility that we're going to have a Super Bowl with the Detroit Lions versus Kansas City or Baltimore. And let me tell you this for the record. If it does come down to that, look out, because anything's possible. I can't sleep on Detroit. They can beat you a myriad of ways, and they're tough. 
They're not soft. And so whatever the situation is, they can handle it. Let's pay attention to that as we move forward. Let me transition to my next subject, because this next subject is near and dear to my heart. I must say it is. Because, you know, it seems that the Dallas Cowboy fans are not the only people extremely upset with the team's latest playoff failure, in case you haven't noticed. Several family members of prominent players actually have been on the record speaking out regarding the team. C.D. Lamb, star wide receiver, his mama, Lita Marim Ramirez, look at what she posted on Facebook. Quote, Dak isn't it. Dak Prescott's brother, Tad, he wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter, quote, cowboy fans, why continue to DM me? Trust me. If I could get Dak to leave Dallas, I would. I, too, want him out of Dallas. And then there's Micah Parsons' brother. We all know who Micah Parsons is. Modern day Lawrence Taylor, that brother, that special brother. I don't care how he looked, you double and triple team. Him. Micah Parsons is big time. His brother knows it. His brother's name is Terrence Parsons Jr. He also took to X slash Twitter. To say, quote, I can't wait because y'all are really clueless out here. Laugh my effing ass off. The greatest crimes to this man is being done by his own organization. Y'all going to miss him when he's gone. Mm -mm -mm. Now, I must confess, I can't help but laugh. I mean, you know, I have to admit, you know, I got to take credit for this. You see, Callis, Dallas Cowboys Nation is divided. Y'all are fighting with each other. Y'all ain't got no love for each other now. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. The nauseating, disgusting fan base that you are that gets on my last damn nerves. You're not getting on each other's nerves. I love it. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. And I say just a minute because before I give you my response, there is a response from Mr. Micah Parsons himself following what his brother, Terrence Parsons Jr., tweeted. Quote, any comments made by Terrence Parsons Jr. are his and his alone. As you know, if I have something to say, I'm not afraid to say it. I love my team. My brother's on my team in the city of Dallas, and I'm more committed than ever to bring a championship to the greatest fan base on earth. Good cleanup on the part of Micah Parsons. And in all fairness, let's be very, very clear about something. Micah Parsons has never given any kind of indication whatsoever that he wants to be out of Dallas. So his brother was out of pocket by tweeting what he tweeted. It's perfectly within his right to do so. You're going to miss him when he's gone, but that implies he wants to leave. Now, maybe Micah Parsons wants to be in some place like Philadelphia. I don't know. I can't imagine him wanting to leave Dallas. For football reasons, they are America's team. They are the most expensive franchise worth $9 billion when the average NFL franchise is worth over $5 billion. All of those things are true. But the flip side is, no matter how great you are, wearing a Dallas Cowboy uniform, even I have to admit, brings you marketability and allows you to make additional dollars off the court, off the field, rather. So I get that. But let me get back to the bigger point here, which is this. Dallas Cowboy fans, it's your fault. You brought this on yourself. You see, let me tell you a little secret, because I'm tired of being right, because I've been right for 29 straight years, so I've been rubbing it on y'all long enough. I'm going to give you a reprieve, and I'm going to give you some little insight. You see, those are human beings who play for you, human beings with egos who either respond to pressure or succumb to it. Some are made for it. I ain't worried about no Micah Parsons. I don't care about he didn't have a sack or anything like that. When you're double and triple teaming, then what the hell you expect? But I know that brother's a rough ride. I know he's something special. When Trayvon Diggs comes back, that's going to elevate your secondary even more. And you won't see Stephon Gilmore getting burned like he did against Green Bay. That's true, too. 
And the rest of this chance, yes, we know that Dallas needs to get more size at the linebacker spot because we know when you penetrate the initial line of defense, their secondary is relatively soft, very fast, okay, very fast, very athletic, but not a lot of girth, which means you can ground and pound them. And if you ground and pound them, they got to stack the line. When they stack the line, it depletes their secondary. When your secondary is depleted, you can take advantage of it, which is what Green Bay did, led by Jordan Love. And Romeo, Romeo, where are thy Romeo Dobbs? Along with Christian Watson and others. We know this. But here's what I was trying to tell y'all about the Dallas Cowboy fan base, which plays into my hand like a bunch of puppets. You feel the pressure because you remember the five Super Bowls you got. The Roger Starbucks of the world, the Troy Aikmans of the world, the Michael Irvin, Emmitt Smiths of the world, primetime Deion Sanders of the world, people like that, Charles Daly and uh, Charles Haley and all of those other Yeah, I get all of that. You remember that. All I do is remind you. It's going to make you sweat a little bit. It's going to make you shiver and panic a little bit. It's going to build the anxiety. And you're going to put that on the players. And then they're going to fold like cheap tents when it counts most. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. I've gotten to the point where I've gotten bored with being right. You play right into my hands every time. Did you notice weeks ago when I sat up there and said, Cowboys might be the best team in, in the NFC? You really think I meant that? <laughs> you really think I meant that? Of course I didn't. Of course I didn't. You understand? Know I told you. I said, hey. This is what's going to happen. That same fan base that passes gas and tells the world this perfume, that same fan base that'll sit up there and spit in your face and tell you it's rain, is that same fan base, all you got to do is say, I see greatness. And they're going to go like this, yeah, we're going to win Super Bowl. We're going to win Super Bowl. And those expectations are too much for the personnel to handle. You don't have a bell cow at the running back spot. You got an elusive running back in Tony Pollard who's relatively small and can't handle the workload. You got a stud in C.D. Lamb. You know what the problem with that is? Where's your number two? I know it was supposed to be Brandon Cooks, but we know Dak Prescott ain't going to target him when times get tight. He's going to look for his number one option. You got Ferguson at your tight end spot. You understand? Who's pretty damn good, and I get all of that. But when you don't have a running game to worry about, you get to key on routes in between the seams because Dak ain't going to try to take those chances, so he's going to try to go wide right or wide left to C.D. Lamb. Ain't going to work. And, oh, by the way, Michael Gallup's on the squad too. But more importantly than anything else, you don't have the size. You played right into my hands. I knew it. All I had to do was praise y'all, and y'all would get your hopes up and come crashing down like a damn bag of bricks. And that's exactly what you did. And now, to tip the scales even more, you've turned on each other. You got the mamas involved. You got the brothers involved. I mean, Terrence Parsons Jr., what you doing saying something like that? You know better. Michael Parsons is his own man with his own podcast, his own outlet. You know he's absolutely right. You know he's absolutely right. He ain't scared to say what he want to say. But you spoke anyway, because you're frustrated, because you're a Cowboy fan, and you're disgusted with the organization, because they're not giving him the parts that he needs, right? Tell the truth. If you're going to speak, Terrence Parsons Jr., tell the truth. Y'all don't believe in Dak, don't you? Ain't that true? Didn't I tell you it was true? And why does Stephen A. have the right to say this? Because I told you, before the season began, I told you all of them was in Vegas. I told you the Cowboys were everywhere, including Jerry Jones. Everybody was supremely confident, except for when it came to the quarterback. They expected to produce against everybody else. They hoped they would produce versus, or hoped they would produce with Dak Prescott, I'm sorry. They were never secure. They were never confident. They know that when times get rough and clutch, palms get sweaty, asses get tight. And somehow, some way, you're going to have rough riders who stand up to the challenge and they're ready to roll. You're going to have others 
who fade and fold, the kind whose brother ultimately reaches out to the public after sticking out his chest for years, wanting his brother to get paid and wanting his brother to be recognized and wanting his brother to appreciate, to be appreciated. Now that your brother didn't show up, Tad, here you are bitching and moaning about how the fan base getting on him. I thought he was the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. That's what I thought. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Last topic before I get to my next segment would be that of a basketball variety, and that would be Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant is a career 27-point-per-game scorer. He's a two-time NBA champion with the Golden State Warriors, a two-time NBA Finals MVP, a former league MVP with the Oklahoma City Thunder, who's led the league in scoring a few times, and, oh, by the way, is a surefire first ballot future Hall of Famer. It's one of the greatest offensive players this game has ever seen. Let me get that out the way first before I get into the news involving Kevin Durant, because he recently made news when he suggested that he should be in the discussion for greatest player of all time. A reporter took the liberty of asking KD Trey himself, the one and only Kevin Durant, now of the Phoenix Suns, why he isn't widely involved in the greatest of all time conversation. Here was Kevin Durant's quote. Because I went to the Golden State Warriors, why shouldn't I be in that conversation? That's the question you should ask. Why not? What haven't I done? Fair. Let me say this about Kevin Durant. People get on him because he can be temperamental at times or whatever. He's a brilliant brother who's a brilliant basketball player and he's a damn good person. He deserves better than what most of us give him. He is an elite basketball talent, one of the greatest players this game has ever seen. When you look at his career, 27 points per game, when you look at his offensive efficiency, shooting nearly 40% from three, about 50% from the field, the brother is phenomenal. And on the Golden State Warriors, despite the greatness of Steph Curry, the greatest shooter God has ever created, and the greatest shooting backcourt we have ever witnessed in NBA history, Kevin Durant was the best player on that team. All true. Here's the problem, KD. You left Oklahoma City after losing a 3-1 lead and falling in game seven in the Western Conference Finals as a member of the Oklahoma City Thunder with Russell Westbrook as your teammate. And then you departed a month later to the Golden State Warriors, the very team that beat you. At the time, I called it the weakest move I had ever seen by a superstar in my life, and I meant it. Having said that, I never meant for people to use that as an excuse to question your greatness. As I explained on your show, The Boardroom, produced and owned by 35 Ventures, your company, with Jay Williams hosting at the time, what I was appalled by was the clear discrepancy in the balance of power your greatness created because when you went to the Golden State Warriors, there was no competition. It was a foregone conclusion. I barely watched the NBA that season because we all knew the outcome. You robbed the basketball world of suspense because you had an opportunity to compete against the greatness that had taken you out in a seven-game Western Conference Finals series. And instead of coming back to get them, you left Russell Westbrook to join them. Now, you got your two rings because of it. You got your two NBA Finals MVPs because of it. Some say blame LeBron James because if LeBron James had never taken his talent to South Beach to join D. Wade and Chris Bosh and then ultimately go to four NBA Finals and win back-to-back -back championships, you probably wouldn't have elected to do that with Golden State, where you ended up winning back-to-back -back titles and, by the way, would have won three straight, in my humble opinion, because there's no way in hell Kawhi Leonard and the Toronto Raptors would have beaten a healthy Golden State Warriors squad. You would have took them out in four. I might give them one game, maybe, and I doubt that.
with Kawhi Leonard, with Kyle Lowry, with Pascal Siakam, and the rest of the crew. There is no way in hell they would have beaten the Golden State Warriors with you, KD, along with the Splash Brothers. So you could have three-peated. But here's the bottom line. You went and joined a stacked deck, albeit one you made into a stacked deck. Before you got there, you couldn't win. And after you departed, you haven't won. Now, I'm one that's willing to concede you'd have won the championship if Kyrie hadn't hurt his ankle in that Milwaukee series. Remember, I said you were going to drop 50 in that game five at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. You dropped 49 and you missed the last free throw. Because I know what kind of greatness I'm looking at when I watch you play. And I believe you would have beat Milwaukee that series and you'd have went on to beat Atlanta in the conference finals and you went on to beat the Phoenix Suns in the finals. I believe that. You and Kyrie, absolutely. Without question. I firmly believe that. With Harden, who was hurt, by the way, but still tried to go was game seven. I believe that. But it didn't happen. And because it didn't happen, that means you didn't win before. That means you didn't win after. Fair or not, all the brouhaha surrounding Kyrie Irving had people thinking, where's the leadership from Kevin Durant? They also asked, you left Steph Curry to join Kyrie? Fair or unfair? I think you're one of the greatest ever. I think anybody who knows basketball should consider you one of the greatest ever. But when you take into account why you're not in that conversation, it doesn't just involve your athleticism, your basketball skills, and your ability. It also includes leadership and your ability to galvanize the troops around you to maximize their potential so you're getting the most out of them, not just yourself. That's how LeBron got Cleveland into the finals in 2007. That's how he got to nine straight NBA finals. That's what people are comparing you to. That is why you're not in that conversation. Fair or unfair. Up next, part two of my interview with the one and only Gilbert Arenas from Gil's Arena. That sensational podcast he's got going very, very well for himself and his boys. He's up next, part two with yours truly. Back with more in a minute. What's that? Where you putting the desk, uh, box open on my desk? Just open it. Just open it. Just open it. Man, you couldn't have opened it for me? <sighs> what? Ah, <laughs> <Yeah. sighs> my new book on paperback. I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it a lot. It works for me. It works for me, y'all see this. New foreword and all. Stephen A. in paperback, straight shooter, memoirs, second chances, and first takes. I haven't gotten over that picture. It does look pretty smooth. I must say so myself. It's a bestseller. I'll hold on to this. Hope you go out and get it. Thank y'all so much for the love and support. Wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. As you recall, I had the pleasure of talking to Gilbert Arenas just last week, uh, owner for the podcast Gil's Arena who's basically climbing up the charts, talking basketball pretty much four days a week. He's established himself as a voice in the basketball community, and uh, it was my pleasure to have him on. Part one of that interview was Friday. I promised you that part two was coming. Well, here it is, a continued conversation with yours truly and Gilbert Arenas. Who's been unfair to Gilbert Arenas? 
who's been unfair with uh, as for I'm, what? I'm, when I'm talking about when you were playing, whatever reputation you have, whatever stigmas you had attached to you over the years, whatever your personality was perceived as being, whatever the case may be, as you reflect on your life in professional sports while a participant as a player and beyond being in this medium right now, who's been unfair to Gilbert Arenas in your estimation? And how so were they unfair? See, now that's unfair. <laughs> um, the, reason, the reason is this. If you knew me personally and was reporting us every day, then you had a sense of who I was and what I put into the game and all that stuff. So, you know, you're not in Washington, right? You know, Skip is not. So what you guys say from the outside is what you guys are seeing in real time. So right. it's not you're not being unfair because you're judging the picture you're seeing, mm -hmm. right? Um, usually when, when we just talk about just being unfair, right? Like somebody like a Mulberry or, um, you know, being called a ball hog, right. um, you know, Steve Francis, right? right? Um, the unfair, the unfairness of that era was, the, you guys didn't understand there was a shift being made. Okay, explain that. Right, and the, the shift was that the athletic, the athletic guard, the combo guard that had the passing skills as a point but had the advantage over the small points was coming into the NBA, mm. right? And at that moment in time, you know, the, the, the Allen, but it was more of the Baron Davises and all those guys, mm -hmm. right, coming into the NBA. And we're like, wait, hold on. This is not a pure point. The John Stockton, the Gary Payton, they were being replaced by a 2.0. So the game you see today, you killed that era who was creating this new style. Okay. I got a pass because I didn't have a big man. So because I didn't have a big man, no one really looked at me as a ball hog because I was in more of a system, right? Princeton offense, I was just smart enough to know how to get my points winning. But as a shooting guard, I wasn't effective to the point where I was going to be a dominant player because I was undersized. I'd be post up. I would have been post up a lot, right? I didn't have no advantage over the Kobe's and all of them. Over the point guards being 6'4", 220, right? Fast. I can sit in the post all day against them. So the, that new wave was coming in, and because everybody was stuck in tradition, right? it wasn't looked at as the same. But see, but see, I disagree with you. Let me tell you why I disagree with you. Let's use Marbury as an example. Mm -hmm. Covering Marbury for the New York Daily News in New York City when he was a high schooler there, I consider – Stephon Marbury. We're, we're talking about Kenny Anderson was in the city. Mm -hmm. We talk about Kenny the Jet Smith was in the city, both at Archbishop Malloy. We're talking about Rod Strickland was in the city, Dwayne Pearl Washington, who went to Syracuse. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest show in the history of college basketball myself. When I looked at Dwayne Pearl Washington, Nate Tiny Archibald, I consider Stephon Marbury arguably the greatest point guard to ever come out of New York City. Mm -hmm. That's how phenomenal he was, right? You go to the pros, you get picked. Uh, you got, I think you got number four, uh, Ray Allen went number five and then they swapped. If I remember correctly, mm -hmm. my issue, a lot of people's issue with Stephon Marbury wasn't what you just pointed out to use him as an example. Mm -hmm. The issue was he wanted out of Minnesota. He didn't want to be in that city when he didn't want to be in that cold weather, et cetera, et cetera. And we like, you left a big ticket. You left KG mm -hmm. and there's no situation that you went to that was better than what you departed from. So it wasn't people dissecting and analyzing the game, not even seeing what you just highlighted, which is accurate, by the way, in terms of how the game was changing and, and morphing into something else. But it was about the fact that it's supposed to be about the chip. There's an opportunity for you to get it. And the decision that you made to depart to go elsewhere is what cost you chips mm -hmm. in a lot of people's eyes. What do you say to that? That's, that's information I didn't know. Right. All right. That, you know, like when it comes to like people wanting out, sometimes the individual, the individual success when you're younger is more important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the all stars, the all NBAs and, you know, um, 
that does play a, a factor, right? You are Mulberry, and then Kevin Kevin Garnett's name is bigger than yours. Right. And you're like, I, I want my own team. Right? That's what Kyrie did with LeBron. That's right. Right? And that happened, that happens a lot because we don't see the big picture when we're younger. Mm. Right? And you know, if you ask him now, he probably does regret it. Because the way he moved, it didn't help him moving forward. He was looked at as a selfish player, right? Um, with his resume, he should be a Hall of Famer. You know, yeah, I don't know. 20 and 8, 20 and 8 yeah. career. Yeah, Absolutely. I don't know the metrics on how they judge it, but I'm pretty sure if he didn't leave and had the same numbers, he would probably be a Hall of Famer. So yeah. we do have regret on, you know, the decisions we make. Um, you know, I came in the league like – you know, um, in 2001. So, you know, I wasn't studying the ins and the outs then, right? All I just see is like, damn, you know, man, man, he, you know, they calling him selfish and he got eight assists. Shit, I only got five. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but I, the selfish, I the selfish tag was because he left the winning situation. Okay. Uh, looking at you, getting back to you, knocking down 16 to 17 shots from three-point range in roughly 90 seconds recently. You just turned 42 years of age in January, right? January yes, 6th, sir. remember correctly? Uh -huh. All right, happy belated birthday. Thank um, you. I, I don't see nobody on the Lakers that can shoot like that. You, you ever thought about getting a 10-day contract? Oh, no, no, listen. I, I mean, have you thought about it? Have you thought about it? If I didn't have to, listen, if I didn't have to move, go up and down, Right? If, I can just, <laughs> if I can be a designated shooter, that means I sit there only on offense right. and just wait for the corner pass, I'm your man. You talking about moving more than three to four feet in any direction? No, thank you. These knees ain't it. Right? What I can't, I can shoot, just can't yeah. move doing it. I look at the Lakers right now real quick, just getting back to them to some degree, and I say LeBron and AD playing the way that they're playing. How in God's name can you be struggling if you're the Lakers when all you have to do is your damn job because they're doing everything else? Am I wrong to feel that way? No, 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 you're right. Um, and it's like playing with Michael Jordan, right? Right. Those players could have did more, but they're so into, like, these, these two teams not realizing, listen, they're going to do all the heavy lifting. You still have to have a purpose out there. And I don't think those players, for the most part, know what they're supposed to do when they're out there. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, like I, I was breaking down something yesterday on the show when Van, right? AD has the ball at the top of the key. Van's on the right corner. AD drives. He gets the end one. Van is still in the corner. The problem with it is the person who, try, who tried to take the charge was Van's guy, mm. right? Soon as your man left, you should have been going for a lob. Right. That was a guaranteed two, like the Matrix. Be that guy. Be the guy. Your guy is not guarding you. Go set a pick. Mm -hmm. So the guy can come up, because your guy's not paying attention to you. Set a pick. Set a flare. D do something. Sitting in the corner being atmosphere is not it. It's hard. That is a hard game. I've been in that situation. So it's now like, hey, listen, can you please set 10 picks a game when you're in? You set 10 picks a game. You are actually helping because your man is running and sitting in the lane. So that's how me and Antoine, your guy is running back all the way to the lane first. Run into a pick and roll. Run into a pick and roll. And that's where we started getting the run into the pick and roll. His guy's there. Now his guy got to run up. I can split him because he's moving too fast. And it's like you have to really understand the game and look at it from different perspectives. And these guys are just happy to be on a court instead of being a part of this team to help win. Gil, I got Boston as the best team in the NBA. Um. I shouldn't say that. I got them coming out of the East. I got Denver, the reigning defending champions, is the best until they're dethroned because we don't see Jokic going anywhere. We know what Jamal Murray can do. We know they've got size in their front line like you highlighted earlier. Here's my breakdown of the East. I think Boston, the only thing that will stand in their way is if they continue to be too reliant on the threes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. You Jason Tatum, you Jalen Brown, you're too damn athletic to get to the hole. Uh, Porzingis, you're 7'3". I don't give a damn. You're 7'3". All right, mm -hmm. figure it out. 
You, you shoot the threes, but you need to be you need to be dunking a few of those baskets. Okay. You look at Derek White, Drew Holiday, and how they can defend, and what you got in the backcourt. You could question Boston's depth, but to me, the impediment to their success will be if they're too reliant on three point shots. Mm-hmm. Milwaukee. I got a real concern about Adrian Griffin because he ain't bulldozing holes on the defensive side of the ball in terms of coaching. We know what they can do offensively, but if you know you can score against a team like you can score against Milwaukee, as Indiana has shown, you could be had. And then there's Philly. I said the other day, Tobias Harris is the key. The brother's mm-hmm. not a scrub. He can ball. He can give you 20 a night. Mm-hmm. And if he's doing that, and Embiid and Maxi play the way that they're playing into the playoffs, Philly's got a chance. Even though Indiana got Pascal Siakam, I still don't give them much of a chance. The <laughs> Knicks have improved offensively. I'm not giving them a chance outside of the Eastern Conference semifinals. Miami, I like Ami Hakez. This brother can play. I think mm-hmm. it helps them, but I don't think you should be able to beat Boston. And I think Boston would have beat them in that game seven if Jason Tatum hadn't gotten hurt the first offensive play of the game. So it comes down to Boston and Denver for me. What about you? I'm looking at the same same type of lineup, right? Um, you know, Boston, Denver on the other side, and unless, you know, like the Suns start clicking, the Lakers figure something out, or the Clippers somehow dodge Denver um, and someone else puts them out. When, when you're talking about Boston, you know, I – when they first had to start in five, I said I do not like this team if they are relying on – two, six, four, ones, and twos. That is not the dangerous lineup that you can put out there. When you put Tatum at the two or Brown at the two, that becomes a very, very hard matchup for any shooting guard in the in the NBA to have to guard Tatum. Now he's going to start posting up, right? Or Brown, who's going to start posting up. And if you go Tatum at the one, Brown at the two, um, Porzingis at the three, and you go Luke and uh, Horford, you can be big as hell, right? Mm-hmm. So because of your your shooting guard and your small or your two best players are actually bigger, they're because they're they're sitting at about six eight to six nine six ten, depending, <laughs> you know who you ask. You know those are two big dudes. Um, you can really you can really adjust during the playoffs. The problem, the only problem that I see them having is. They rely too much on a jump shot, right? Um, they play five out, which is AAU basketball, right? Right. Um, when you're playing AAU basketball, it's five out. What do you think the defense is in? He's in shell. So I pass. I don't cut, and I give it to you. You try to take it. Someone's at the elbow. They pass it. They pass. You, you sit there making eight passes around, and someone's. And Tatum and Brown never play off each other. It's <laughs> no. like it's my turn now. It's your turn now. It's my turn. No three man game between. Uh, Porzingis, him, and and Brown, like what? Right? That, that is that is but that is butter. No one is fit to guard you three, and you play in a triangle on the weak side or the strong side. That's one thing. Um, so that's the only issue I have is taking too many jumpers. Um, now with with Bucks, we look at their defense. Um, it's not as bad as you would think, right? Right. The numbers is bad. Yeah, they they were ranked four numbers last year. But, you know, they were giving up 113, but they were scoring 116 last year. This year, they're giving up 119, but they're scoring 124. Last year was plus three. This year, they're plus five, right? So they're scoring a little bit more than they were on the defensive end. You know, we're just focusing on the defensive part on it, but they're plus two than they were last year. So the, the only problem with them will be, are we going to have a real Middleton? Because without Middleton, they have no chance, right? Right. They need their third star being a third star. You can't have the two 10 points here. No, you have to be a third star because everybody else's third star is balling. Mm. Right. If you injured, then you're injured. Right. But we can't. There's no more. If you're going to try to win the championship, the injury factor is is not in void, you know, because you got Bill as a third option. You got West. I mean, you got James Harden as a as a third option. You got Tobias as a third option. Porzingis as a third option. You have to be a real third option now. Gotcha. Right. And with Philly, Philly's 
Only issue is going to be the fourth quarter with Embiid. Are you going to, only if you're playing Boston or Miami, are you going to use your team in the last five minutes or are you going to keep trying to do it yourself? Right? You know, uh, four or five bad shots, three or four turnovers in that crucial moment because you're trying to be the hero. And that's why Boston always had the best of him. He gets tired in the fourth, right? And then from there, it becomes just the Embiid show. When it's designed to make it the MB show and kill off the rest of your team. Mm-hmm. So you're, you do good enough to say, I got my numbers, but yep. you're losing the game. Not realizing there's some series that you might only have 20, yep. 14 rebounds, but nine assists, right? Yep. When that series comes up, you're going to have to recognize it. And, mm-hmm. and so far, he hasn't recognized that series yet two questions before I let you get on out of here man and I appreciate your time Gilbert one is is it a basketball podcast or do you want it to be far more than that I'm talking about Gil's Arena with you and the crew Josiah Kenyon Martin Rashad McCants it's a ba- it's a basketball podcast because that's what we know mm-hmm. right that's what we are experts at you know um, we'll We'll poke fun of everything else, right? Um, Because we're four times a a week. So, you know, there's not a lot of stories when you're you're active every day. You know, you know, you you start sounding like a broken record. You know, I know. (laughs) Right? So, you know, we we throw in a little bit of everything else. Um, Only Kenyon watches football, right? So, you know, we're, we're limited. You don't watch football? You don't watch the NFL. What's wrong with you? I I'm, mean, you're the first person in America I met that don't watch the NFL. When listen, when I was, I grew up playing football. My daddy was a football player. I'm Dion. I'm the era of Dion Sanders wearing Dion Sanders shoes. Right. Like I'm the prime time. So I only knew prime time. Right. That's that's all I knew. That's all I prime time. When I. When I fell in love with basketball, like I played it, and then Penny Hardaway got drafted, right? And I'm just watching the draft, and the way he moved, I said, that's who I want to be. I got to high school. I wore 25 because of Penny Hardaway. Big Magic fan. That's all. My whole room, magic, everything, right? right? You couldn't tell me nothing. Uh, Penny Hard, you couldn't tell me that when him and Shaq got in the fight, I don't like Shaq no more because of it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because Penny was mad. And then when Kobe got drafted, an 18 year old coming into the NBA, and I'm in high school, had the fro, and just listening to him talk, listening to him study, I, I became. NBA fan. Right. But you brought up Kobe and you were like a nemesis of his because he was the black mom and you called yourself the black mongoose, at least in some circles, because you want to go at him. Because I understood the only way you get respect is to battle. Mm. Right? There's no Kobe did you wasn't he wasn't respecting you if he was, hey, you're my favorite player. No, no. Did you study for me? Right. Yes. Are you watching me closely? Yes. Are you afraid of me? No. No. How did you, you feel, how did you feel when you heard Smush Parker say, uh, uh, you know, I saw this online where he was talking about Kobe never talked to him. Kobe was like, you, you ain't worthy of speaking to me or whatever. How did you feel when, when you heard Smush Parker say that about Kobe? Knowing Kobe, then you didn't deserve to talk to him. And here's why. If you listen to a Quran, you listen to Quran anybody Butler. who played with him, right. one thing you're always going to hear is he randomly called you weird hours, 3 a.m. What are you doing? 5 a.m. What are you doing? Oh, I'm already at the gym. Come on. Your decision right there when you pick up that phone right. will let you know if you win his circle or not. So that means if he didn't like you, 
and he didn't talk to you is because he called you. He and gave you a chance. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I know, you know, I know what, what you going to do. I'm in the media and I got calls early in the damn morning for crying out loud. And I answered because it was him. <laughs> if it was if you didn't answer that damn call or you didn't come with him when he told you to, he was done with you. He's Make gonna, no mistake about it. Yeah, because he's going to test. He's going to test your love. Right. There's no. Yeah, I'm sleep. You know, I hit you. With, no. OK, drop. I'm dropping everything because he loved it so much. He wanted people who loved it just as much as him to be his teammates, to be his teammates. Be his so teammates. If you so you wasn't his teammate. You just a dude that that he got to you got to be in the game with him. Mm. And that that's and and this is what I don't like about teammates sometimes and my 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 my. Why I'm hard on Jordan Poole sometimes. Yeah, because they don't tell the whole story. You, do you not know who you are in the locker room with? Mm. Right, Smush, you got Kobe Bryant, right? Poole, you have Curry and Clay. When you're, when you're watching them, what the hell are you watching? You're not watching their preparation. You're not watching their work ethic. You're not watching their professional. What are you watching then? Are you just looking at them as teammates? You're not looking at them as a, a blueprint of success? Right. If Kobe said he gets in the gym at 2 o'clock, God damn it, I'm there too. LeBron is showing the world right. how he's lasted 21 years. Yeah. Taking exactly. care of himself, his body, what he eats, how he works out, et cetera, et cetera. Why are you not duplicating that? Why are you not emulating it? Especially when you're his damn teammate and you're around him all the damn time. How come you can't do that for yourself? Absolutely. I'm at the, he's at the gym at noon, at the gym at 1 p.m. Ain't no damn way I'm coming at 5 or 6 no more. Yeah. No. He's here at five, 1. Mm. I'm here at 1, 2. I need to see everything he's doing because it's greatness. I don't think we look at greatness to to duplicate it. Right. We, we want to marvel at it. We want to be spectators when you're in a position where you can try to emulate it to the degree where you can benefit from it because it'll at least make you better. Maybe not make you as great as them, but it'll make you better. If I'm, if I'm following as long, hey, listen, I might not be at the same speed as the, 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 the Bugatti, right? And I'm in my Honda, yep. but I can still see the smoke. And, and, and as long as I'm following the same path, mm -hmm. I'm going to be better off following that car than trying to find my own path. Right. Let me transition. Last question to you. Very last question. Because I got to run out of here. And I appreciate your time. Gills Arena, mm -hmm. if I said to you, a year from now, mm -hmm. what do you want this to be? What do you want Gills Arena to mean to the world of basketball, to the world of sports, to the world of podcasting? What do you, how do you answer that question? Um, unbiased information from, you know, athletes. Fair for the most part. <laughs> yeah. A place for entertainment place for laughter, place for argument, just a real rounded um, podcast with ex-players that's giving their views on today's game. Um, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, right? We're just trying to add to all the greatness that's already here, right? Um, you know, you know, just watching everyone's podcast, watching yours, watching Shannon's, watching, you know, the, the TNT, the ESPN crew, just giving an extra lift to just broadcasting itself, right? We can't play anymore, right? Um, we didn't go to school for the broadcasting, so you guys have the advantage over that. Like, we can say whatever we want about the basketball part, but we don't have the knowledge and the information and how to do and how to push the, the envelope. So we're lacking that part, right? So we have to respect what you give, too. And that's why, why I really take it serious. And Dwayne Wade told me, he told me that. He said, listen, you're going to be on TV. You can't use Gilbert Arenas, the basketball player, and come in like you're a three-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA. You are a rookie in this world. Now go. 
Yeah. So when I when he told me that, it was like, you're right. Okay, all right. Stephen A. Smith, all right, skip here. And I just sit there and watch. And watch. Watch the dress, watch the talk. Like watching to learn. Yeah. And, and you do, because you always reach out. You always reach out and you never hesitate to ask for advice. Ever. I know that for a fact. And I think just some 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 people, I think we get we're, we're I think we're so afraid because of you say something to me when I played, right? Yeah. And the moment we first said, like, what'd you say to me when I played? That that's fair. Right? right? That's fair. So I'm not a basketball player anymore. I'm 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 in your world and I'm trying to learn from the top tier. <laughs> like I, I can come in here and try it myself, but I know I'm a fail. So let me just watch and study and then go from there. You know, I'm online damn near eight hours a day wow. watching, researching, looking, trying to understand the algorithm, trying to understand like, and you know, that's what you get. You're getting, you know, a person who's trying to be a professional, trying to, to, to be one of the greats in this world, mm -hmm. in this, you know, in this, in this lane. All right. Gilbert Arenas, man, I appreciate you, bro. Thank you so much for your time. It was a great time talking to you. And, yes, even with those brothers on the air with you, I will come on if they want me to come on. I will happily come in studio <laughs> on your basement and hang with y'all and, and, and talk some hoops or anything else y'all want to talk about, man. So, listen, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come on just like you promised. I really appreciate it. You know I'm always here for you. And, obviously, like I promised you, oh, you're going to be on first take. Get uh, in. Trust me, I, I'm gonna make that happen. Consider uh, so it. You gonna put, listen, you gonna get Ocho mad at me. <laughs> listen, I, I got to deal with that. Ocho's my man. I got mad love for Ocho. He knows that. So, yeah. so listen, listen. Here, you know, don't, don't sleep on the possibility of him. You never know with me. I am uh, the, I, I, I'm gonna see what I could do about him. But, but definitely, you'll be on come basketball season. Appreciate you, bro. Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate you. Thank you. No doubt. One and only Gilbert Arenas right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with more in a minute. Thanks again to the one and only Gilbert Arenas. Make sure you check out his podcast, Gil's Arena. You want to know something about basketball? You know what everything, want to know what everybody's thinking, what's percolating? Definitely, that's one of the places you should definitely tune into. But stay here in the meantime, because up next, the one and only Cat Williams. New media. Somebody once talked about that. They had no idea how crazy it could get. What does that, meaning him, as in Cat Williams, and former President Donald Trump have in common? Stay tuned, and I'll break it down to you. More of the Stephen A. Smith Show on YouTube in a minute. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Thank you for continuing to join me. You know, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that have been percolating in the media recently. For example, a recent interview conducted with Cat Williams, led by my brother, my friend, my partner in crime on First Take every Monday and Tuesday morning, the one and only Shannon Sharp on his club, Shay Shay Podcast. It's turned into a full-blown cultural phenomenon. We can act like we don't know. People can act like they don't want to admit that. We need to stop. Some are calling this type of interviewing as new media. Everybody's sitting there and they're talking about, there's very little fact checking and all of this other stuff. That's what they're trying to say. That's what they're trying to say. I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong to get on Shannon Sharp about that stuff. But stay with me for a second, because right now at this particular moment in time, before I go any further on this subject, I want to defer for a moment to Golden State Warriors forward and four-time champion Draymond Green, because on numerous occasions in the past, he's referred to himself as the new media. Remember, after Scott Van Pelt of ESPN inferred once upon a time that Green is part of the regular media, he shot back saying this. The good news is, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you're part of the media now, and you get to control the conversation from your perspective, and I know you'll New be... New media. You, you, I, so that's it. And, and, and Stephen A's part of it, as you said, right? And by the way, go watch the Draymond Green show. I said Stephen A sometimes act like the new media. Sometimes he doesn't. That's on you, but, you know, uh, nonetheless, don't just lump me in with media, baby. It's the new media. See, what Draymond was trying to say was this. You have 
conventional media, usually consisting of scribes, pundits, commentators, etc., who never played the game on the elite level he's obviously played the game at. Therefore, we're, absence of a, we're absent of a perspective, devoid of the kind of content they're capable of providing because they're in the locker rooms, they're wearing the uniforms, they're actually experiencing some of the things that we chronicle. We're not the ones doing that. So what would we know? And our definition of facts, they may challenge on a number of occasions as being false as opposed to factual. That's essentially what Draymond Green was alluding to. Needless to say, I would refute that to some degree because true reporters, true insiders, get the information from the actual sources. So just because you're saying it yourself now doesn't mean that they were wrong to say what they said in the past if they got it from the sources before they disseminated that information. The information is still the information. But that's a subject for another day. Because when we talk about a cultural phenomenon, understand what transpired with Shannon Sharp and Cat Williams. People have been going off about Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp had to let everybody know, I'm not a journalist. I'm an entertainer. I told him he's more than that. He's a voice. Make sure you understand that, accept that Shannon Sharp, but the flip side to it is this. What he's saying is, I'm engaging in conversation. So just like I spoke about Steve Harvey, or I spoke to Steve Harvey, Steve Harvey came on Club Shay Shay, Kevin Hart came on Club Shay Shay, I gave them the platform, Cedric the Entertainer, Cat Williams had that luxury as well. I treated them all the same. That is Shannon Sharp's position. Ladies and gentlemen, if it is his position, then he is correct. Because he's not, quote unquote, a journalist. And if he gave others an opportunity to speak, uninterrupted, without necessarily probing investigative questions, if he treated them all the same, then more power to him. But the reason why it's applicable here when we talk about a cultural phenomenon is because I don't recall an article, I don't recall an interview on television, I don't recall a commentator or a pundit speaking on a particular issue or having somebody speak on it and drawing over 50 million views. 50 million. We're talking all-time record. Maybe Joe Rogan once had one a little bit more. When all is said and done, as of the next week or two, it is entirely plausible that the Cat Williams interview on Club Shay Shay will have generated more views than anything in history, period. And when that's our reality, and we start talking about new media, well, what does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? You know what it means? It means something very simple. People are not allowing you to define what media is to them any longer. They're telling you what it is to them. And if you want to engage in dialogue about how Cat Williams wasn't factual or he may not have told the truth here about Steve Harvey or he may not have told the truth here about Ricky Smiley or he may have embellished something here about Kevin Hart or a Cedric the Entertainer, what the American public at the very least is showing you and telling you is that what matters to them most is their truth. They don't give a shit about the facts. They care about what they believe based on what you've disseminated. They're looking for dialogue. They're looking for water cooler conversation. They're looking for a discussion to have amongst themselves as opposed to truth. I'm not saying Cat Williams is lying about anything. I'm not saying he's telling the truth. I don't know. What I'm saying is neither do the 50 plus million people who watch the interview, but they don't care. All they care about is that they were entertained and they got something to talk about, to vibe back and forth about, to engage in dialogue, bantering, and debate about. And that's all that matters. Why, in God's name, would I turn around, bringing that point up, and bring up our former president, Donald Trump? <sighs> it's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. 
Because whether you like it or not, some could compare the actions of Cat Williams to the frequent behavior of the former president who continuously speaks even when no one's calling him out. Donald Trump is a non-establishment person saying and doing whatever the hell he pleases and doesn't give two shits about what anybody has to say. Go back and listen to Cat Williams. Did he care? Did he care about what he said about Steve Harvey? Did he care about what he said about Kevin, Kevin Hart? Did he care about what he said about Ricky Smiley? Did he care about how he mimicked and insulted Cedric the Entertainer? He didn't care. And why were people gravitating to him? It's not just because Cat Williams is unbelievably hilarious and one of the elite comedians in this world, if we're being quite honest. It's because he has the reputation of someone who does not care to capitulate to the system. Let's take into account Donald Trump. Four federal indictments, 91 counts. This man could end up being a convicted felon in a matter of weeks or months. God forbid they put him in a zebra suit and put him behind bars. According to our Constitution, he could still run for the president of the United States and win. And win. Because there's nothing constitutionally against that. And while he's had these charges levied against him, his popularity has only grown. The dollars have come pouring into his campaign. That's what he's using to pay all these legal fees. Why you think Rudy Giuliani and others went to him for help? Because he's the one with the money. Where are you getting the money from? He damn sure ain't spending his own. Donald Trump has gone against the grain time and time and time again. Talked about Jeb Bush. Remember when he was running against the former governor of Florida? No, low energy. Remember Marco Rubio, senator, senator in Florida, little Marco. Remember when Carla, Car, Carla Fiorini was running for the presidency? He said she's a four. They said, what about Cory Booker when he was the president? What about going against Cory Booker? Not a chance. John Lewis, former representative, an iconic figure in the civil rights movement, went on national television. Donald Trump did this. Well, I ain't got nothing nice to say about him. He ain't saying nothing nice about me. Mimicking and making fun of people with disabilities. It doesn't stop. Because it curries votes. Every time he's insulting, every time, every time he's demeaning, every time he comes across like he doesn't give a damn about what anybody thinks and especially what the system has to say, feel, or think about him. Folks in America love it. Cat Williams, no different. We have never heard anybody go off on people during an interview the way Cat Williams called out some of the elite comedians in this world who have been highly successful, multimillionaires, I might add, and Cat Williams talked about them like they were trash. So much so, it offended one of the great ones himself, the one and only Dave Chappelle, who's very cool with Cat Williams, by the way, but felt the need to address and, dare I say, blast Cat Williams for his takedown of his fellow comedians. Listen and look on this full screen as to what Dave Chappelle said. What part of the game is this? He only ethered N-word. He didn't say anything about any of these white boys. None of these white boys function like that. Cat is one of the best painters in the game. So why are you drawing ugly pictures of us? Stop. Hurt people hurt people. 
but I am a hurt person that never hurt people. And he does it all the time. I didn't hear anything that you did wrong. He didn't do nothing wrong, question mark. Cat didn't do nothing wrong. That's what Dave Chappelle said Friday on stage at the Hollywood Improv. You know it's bad when even comedians are offended. But that's what it has regressed into. Because Cat Williams got the underground on lock. The streets love Cat Williams. They appreciate his definition of candor. They appreciate his interpretation of fact. They appreciate the fact that he basically gives the conventional public the finger. And because of it, it's made him even more of a notable figure than his greatness as a comedian, which was very significant and impactful, by the way, even had him. That's how he reminds you, or should remind you, of Donald Trump. Any change that has taken place in our world has been provoked by the younger generation. You know why? Because I've never met a young person who doesn't want to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, according to their own conditions, without having to give a damn about anybody. And in the age of digital and streaming, where linear is fading in the mind's eye of people all over this globe, why is that? Because people would rather watch something on their phone or their iPad or their computer rather than watching television. And by the way, they don't want to watch it at 10 o'clock or 12 noon or 3 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening. They want to watch it when the hell they want to watch it, where the hell they want to watch it, when they want to watch it, etc. They want to do what they want to do. And if you want to appeal to the younger generation, which is a targeted demographic, 18 to 34 or 25 to 49, that's what you have to be about. The Democrats call themselves progressives, as if they think progressively, and they're forward thinkers. Yet, in the year 2024, they're begging an 82-year-old and Joe Biden to come to the rescue, because they can't find anybody to beat Donald Trump. That's how bad things have gotten, but it's a reason. And the reason is because the system has been so insidious for so long, people are disgusted with it. The old guard, they ain't going for anymore. We thought it was just in politics, which explains Donald Trump. Now we see how it's trickled down even to the likes of the Cat Williams of the world. And you know how it goes, right? They may be the ones, but they ain't the only ones. They always beget others. There's always a brethren. There's always an offspring, which means the worst is yet to come. It's just the truth. Live with it. That's it for today's show, but before I get on out of here, I want to transition to a very, very sad note, sending our condolences to the King family. Dexter Scott King, the youngest son of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., has died. According to statements from his family and the King Center, the King Center confirmed in a statement that the 62-year-old civil rights activist died Monday after a battle with prostate cancer. The third child of Dr. and Mrs. Coretta Scott King was married to Leah Weber King since 2013. Weber King said in a statement from the King Center, quote, he transitioned peacefully in his sleep at home with me in Malibu. She added, he gave it everything and battled this terrible disease until the end. As with all the challenges in his life, he faced this hurdle with bravery and might. 
Dexter Scott King, dead at the age of 62. God bless you and the King family.